Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge my colleagues in the room, too many to mention, but particularly Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce, Maurice Payne, Finance Minister Simon Birmingham, who's been a great partner uh, in this year's budget, to the Assistant Treasurer Michael Suka and to the Assistant Minister for Superannuation um, and Financial Services and Financial Technology, Jane Hume. Can I also acknowledge the Secretary of the Department of Treasury, Stephen Kennedy, uh, and Rosemary Huxtable, two of the finest public servants of their generation who have been outstanding in their roles through the most difficult of times, so thank you very much. Also here today is my very good friend, Greg Hunt, who is departing politics, but who can hold his head very high after an incredible job as Health Minister. He has with him today a very special guest, a lady called Julie Sinney, who is the founder and the CEO of Spinal Muscular Atrophy Australia. Julie tragically lost both her children to spinal muscular atrophy and has led the charge to list Zolgesma on the PBS. A life-saving and a life-changing drug gene therapy to treat infants under the age of nine months. Last night, we listed this drug on the PBS at a record $2.5 million for a one-off treatment. This is the most expensive drug Australia has ever listed on the PBS. It will save 30 children a year and listing drugs like Zogelsma, Zogelsma and last night Trevelvi to treat breast cancer patients is only possible because of a strong economy. And I would like to join you in acknowledging Julie and thanking her for her amazing advocacy to have this drug. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in extraordinary times. A global pandemic has taken more than six million lives. All too frequent natural disasters are devastating local communities. And war in Ukraine has shattered peace in Europe and precipitated a global inflation spike. But despite all the challenges we face, Australia remains resilient and Australians remain strong. In just a few weeks' time, our nation goes to the polls. Voters will face a clear choice. A Liberal National Coalition led by Scott Morrison that has delivered a world-leading economic recovery and now has outlined its long-term plan to create more jobs. And a Labor Party led by Anthony Albanese that has largely hidden from view for the last three years, trying to sneak into government with little more than a false and fanciful promise that he would govern like Bob Hawke and John Howard. The opposite would be true the most left-wing Labor leader since Gough Whitlam, who has spent his entire political career championing higher taxes and higher spending. It's a history the Leader of the Opposition wants to conveniently forget. Ladies and gentlemen, over the last two years, Australians have been tested and there have been setbacks along the way. But we have got the big calls right. Closing our borders in early 2020, which saw Australia avoid the makeshift morgues of Central Park in New York. Implementing JobKeeper, which saved more than 700,000 jobs and put a security blanket across the economy. Responsible tapering and ending of emergency economic support so that crisis level spending was not baked in nor continue any longer 
than necessary. The verdict is now in. Australia has seen an economic recovery that is faster and stronger than the United States, than the United Kingdom, than France, than Germany, than Canada, than Italy and Japan. A double dose vaccination rate of more than 95%, which puts us in the top 10 of the OECD. A mortality rate which per head of population is the third lowest in the OECD. This was not luck. More than 1,000 individual decisions across all areas of government that have put our economy in the strong position it is today. It is our record. And last night I set out our plan for an even stronger future. A future where aspiration and enterprise are encouraged and rewarded, where families have greater flexibility and choice, where those in need get a helping hand, where greater self-reliance leaves our nation less vulnerable. Today, I would like to make four key points. Outlining first how far our economy has come over the last two years, avoiding the economic abyss. Second, how last night's budget banked the dividend of a stronger economy with a material improvement to the budget bottom line. Third, how our plan delivers cost of living relief now and long-term investments in skills small business, manufacturing, infrastructure, the regions and the digital economy to create even more jobs. And fourth, how we are investing more in national security and defence as the global threats to Australia and the world increase. As we gather here today, we are reminded of just how far we have come. In early 2020, Australia faced its biggest economic shock since the Great Depression. Around 1.4 million people, or a little more than 10% of our workforce, lost their jobs or were stood down on zero hours in early 2020. Our economy shrank by an unprecedented 6.8% in the June quarter. To put this in context for you, prior to this, the largest quarterly fall in GDP was 2% back in 1974. GDP fell just 0.5% during the GFC. People were confined to their homes. The economy was put into hibernation and our lives were put on hold. Treasury feared that the unemployment rate could reach as high as 15%. And Labor said the biggest test for the Morrison government's management of the recession would be what happens to jobs and unemployment. Today, Australia's unemployment rate is at 4%, the equal lowest in 48 years. Female unemployment is at its lowest level since 1974. Two million more Australians are now in work than when we came to government. Our economic plan is working. Last night's budget demonstrates that our economy now has real momentum. Growth is higher, unemployment is lower, and wages are strengthening. Real GDP is expected to grow by 4.25% in 21-22 and 3.5% in 22-23. Unemployment is forecast to hit 3.75% by the September quarter and be sustained at that level, 
the lowest in 50 years. Wages have been upgraded in every year of the forecasts and the wages price index is expected to reach 3.25% next year, the strongest in almost a decade. Broader measures of wages are also picking up more quickly. The national accounts measure of wages growth is expected to increase by 5% over the year to June 2022. Inflation is forecast in Australia to increase to four and a quarter percent next year before declining over the estimates period. This is well below that of the United States, where inflation is at a 40-year high of 7.9 per cent. And the United Kingdom, Canada and New Zealand, where inflation is running around 6 per cent. We are now banking the dividends of a stronger economy. By the end of the forward estimates, the bottom line will improve by more than $100 billion. That is since my EFO alone. The budget shows the fastest and strongest improvement to the bottom line in Australia in over 70 years. More people in work, fewer people on welfare, repairing the budget without increasing taxes. At the same time, we are guaranteeing the essential services that Australians rely on, with record funding for schools, for hospitals, Medicare, mental health, aged care, disability support, and last night, a further $2 billion of new measures to improve the safety, the health, and the economic security of women. There are further investments in the environment as we transition to net zero emissions by 2050. In this budget, almost three quarters of the revenue improvement is due to a stronger economy and particularly a stronger labour market. Not the product of baking in high commodity price assumptions, a weakness of Labor's previous budgets. We have maintained a tax to GDP cap of 23.9%, constraining revenue imposes a discipline on the expenditure side of the budget and is consistent with our values of cutting taxes not increasing them. It is then no surprise that Labor has no such discipline and no such tax cap. Having promised $387 billion in higher taxes going into the last election, which would have seen the tax to GDP ratio reach a record high of 25.9 per cent. On the expenditure side, our approach has also been different to our political opponents. When we ended JobKeeper, the opposition leader said the economic roof would come crashing down. Three months later, nearly 120,000 more people were in work. When we ended the COVID disaster payments, the shadow finance minister said that support should not be pulled. A month later, we had the strongest monthly increase in employment on record. They could not have been more wrong. Keeping the spending taps on would have been irresponsible. And our political opponents have made $80 billion of further spending commitments during COVID. This is in stark contrast to the approach that we adopted in last night's budget. Spending as a share of GDP is lower than what was projected at my EFO by the end of the forward estimates and across the medium term. A prudent approach that avoids putting unnecessarily upward pressure on interest rates. By sticking to our fiscal strategy, gross debt peaks four years earlier and 5.4 percentage points lower than what was previously forecast. 
our debt to GDP ratio is less than half of that across G7 economies and around half of that in the United States and Japan. And we remain one of only nine countries in the world to have retained a AAA credit rating from the three leading credit rating agencies. This was again affirmed last night, with S&P confirming our AAA stable rating and acknowledging in their statement Australia's economic recovery is improving the government's fiscal strategy trajectory faster than was previously anticipated. Ladies and gentlemen, the number one topic of conversation around the kitchen tables of Australia right now is cost of living. COVID and events in Ukraine have disrupted global commodity markets and supply chains, driving up the prices of food and fuel. This is a global phenomenon impacting us here at home. The price of oil is up by 50% since the start of the year. Wheat prices are up by 40% since the start of the year. And shipping costs today are more than five times what they were pre-COVID. The budget I, hand I handed down last night responds directly to these pressures in a temporary, in a targeted and in a responsible way. Halving fuel excise for six months, which could save a family with two cars who fill up once a week $700. A temporary $420 cost of living tax offset for over 10 million low and middle income earners. A new one-off $250 cost of living payment to 6 million Australians, including pensioners, veterans, carers and others on income support, concession card holders, including self-funded retirees. Greater access to cheaper medicines for 2.4 million Australians who will now require fewer scripts before they see their medicines either free or at a concessional rate. These measures will provide real relief to Australian families at a time when they need it most. And this comes on top of more than $40 billion in tax relief that our government has provided since the start of the pandemic alone. Lower energy costs have fallen nearly 10% in the last two years and reduced childcare costs for around 250,000 families as a result of measures I announced in last year's budget. Last night's budget not only responds to the pressures of the here and now, it also outlines a long-term plan, a vision for Australia to create more jobs and a more resilient economy. Critical reforms to upskill a new generation of young Australians. Bold new investments in regions of national significance. Expanding Australia's sovereign manufacturing capability. Boosting the competitiveness of our small and large businesses with new investments in infrastructure, energy and the digital economy. And it will be these new investments that will help secure our pathway to net zero emissions by 2050 and respond to the critical global challenge of climate change. During the pandemic, the government invested $13 billion into skills and training, helping to deliver a record 220,000 Australians into a trade apprenticeship, the highest number on record. In last night's budget, we committed a further $2.8 billion to support even more apprentices. And we also lay the foundation for national skills reform with a $3.7 billion investment supporting another 800,000 training places. We understand that no one knows better than a small business owner the skills that they need in their employees. And last night's budget incentivises and rewards small business for helping their employees to upskill. 
For every $100 a small business spends on training their employees, they will get a $120 tax deduction, effectively lowering the cost of training for small businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, 270,000 new jobs were advertised across the country in February. By investing in new and expanded programs to help disadvantaged youth, Indigenous Australians, the mature aged, the Australian, Australians with a disability and helping them all find employment will help more Australians make the most of these opportunities. Equipping our workforce with better skills, making our economy stronger, more innovative and more productive. This is our plan for a stronger future. Nowhere are these opportunities more abundant than in our strong and in our growing regions. Accounting for two thirds of our exports, regional Australia is already a powerhouse of the economy. No government understands this more. We've committed a record $100 billion to our regions since coming to government. And this budget outlines an even more ambitious vision for our regions, leveraging the strengths and proximity to new and growing markets, we will invest in nation-building infrastructure to transform our regions and prime them for further growth. Through targeted investments in land and water infrastructure, low emissions technology and energy generation, resources extraction and processing, we will open up these new frontiers of production and growth. And these landmark investments will help create the next chapter of Australia's economic story. Growing Australia's manufacturing sector will also be key to creating more jobs and making our economy more resilient. In last night's budget, we are providing almost $330 million for manufacturing businesses that eliminate vulnerabilities across our key supply chains. We have secured the manufacturing of mRNA vaccines in Victoria, one of only a handful of countries in the world to have this capability. And we continue to invest in our modern manufacturing strategy, setting out a 10-year blueprint to expand Australia's sovereign manufacturing capability. Medical products, recycling and clean energy, critical minerals, defence, space and food. Last night, I also announced the extension and expansion of our patent box regime, which taxes income from homegrown patents developed by medical and biotech firms at around half the normal company tax rate. Agriculture and low emissions technology businesses will now also benefit, further supporting the commercialisation of Australia's technologies is part of our plan to see Australia become a leading digital economy by 2030. Australia has already seen the emergence of exciting new high-tech companies. Afterplay, Afterpay, Atlassian, Canva, Seek and many more. But every Australian a company is now a digital company. And that is why we've invested more than $3.5 billion in digital initiatives since 2020. And why in this budget we are delivering a new technology investment boost, which will provide a $120 tax deduction for every $100 small businesses spend on computer hardware, software and other digital technologies, up to $100,000 in expenditure each year. Our plan will help businesses to grow, lift their productivity and become more competitive and at the same time make us less reliant on global supply chains. Finally, there is no more important time to strengthen our national security and defence. And this budget does exactly that. Australia, whether we like it or not, faces a less stable region in the years ahead. And we face a more uncertain world. Autocracies are challenging the liberal, rules-based order that has underpinned pro
prosperity in the world since the end of the Second World War. What Russia is doing today is not just challenging the international rules-based order, but will substantially change the trajectory of globalisation. The stakes are high. Strategic competition is on the rise. Economic coercion is more pronounced. Critical supply chains are under pressure. Today, national security and economic security are intrinsically linked. Since coming to government, we have lifted defence spending from less than 1.6% of GDP to around 2% of GDP and growing. We have put in place a $270 billion defence capability plan supporting more than 100,000 Australian jobs across the supply chain. And in the past fortnight, we have announced our plans to expand the size of our defence workforce to more than 100,000 at a cost of $38 billion. To build a new submarine base on the east coast of Australia as part of a more than $10 billion investment in future submarine infrastructure. And last night, we announced a record $9.9 billion 10-year plan to invest in Australia's offensive and defensive cyber capabilities. More data analysts, computer programmers, software engineers to boost our capacity to respond to cyber threats. Make no mistake, if an adversary is able to knock out Australia's banking, energy or telecommunications system, they are halfway to victory. We're also building stronger strategic partnerships. We have been doing this through AUKUS, the Quad, ASEAN and the Five Eyes Network. Australia must always be in a position to stand up for our values and this budget will ensure that we are in that position to do so. After nearly 30 years of uninterrupted economic growth, COVID stopped the Australian economy in its tracks. It was the biggest economic shock since the Great Depression. And while our economy has recovered strongly, we should not lose sight of how far we have come. Just on two years ago, we were literally staring into the economic abyss. Now our economy leads the world. Growth is higher, unemployment is lower, and wages are strengthening. We are on track for an unemployment rate at three and three quarter percent. And we are seeing a material improvement to our budget bottom line. Our economic plan is working and now is not the time to change course. Now is not the time to put all those gains at risk. The budget last night delivers cost of living relief now, a long-term economic plan to create more jobs. It guarantees the essential services that Australians rely on and it invests more in national security and defence at a time where the world is dramatically changing. This is a budget for the times, and this budget will deliver a strong economy and a stronger future. Thank you very much.